Okay. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Let's go ahead and begin as always with prayer and just place ourselves in the presence of the Lord and enter into that inner room that Jesus speaks of where we can just be ourselves, be alone with our Lord and just give him our full attention to direct just our heart and mind towards him and just take that moment to just rest in his presence in silence for a moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we come before you this day, Lord, and we ask you to enlighten our mind with a deeper understanding of the great gift you have given us through the gospel and the oral tradition that has been passed down through each generation in your Catholic Church. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to appreciate it more to assimilate it more and more into our lives and to live it out more authentically and fully each day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, so last week we sort of did the Old Testament background as well as where we see the oral, to oral Torah of the Old Testament used by Jesus, Paul, and other um, authors of the church. Today what we're going to look at is the Christian side of it, Jesus himself, then the apostolic tradition as it was, as it's passed on through the generations, and then we'll talk about how, uh, where the, the teaching church fits in, what we call the magisterium. So it's important to realize, turning now to Jesus, having looked at the oral tradition, um, it's important to realize that the entire gospel was only oral for a long time. Jesus wrote literally nothing that we have any records of. In fact, the only time he's even recorded his writing at all is doodling in the sand at the woman caught of, of adultery. And we don't know if he even wrote anything. He just might have been. So everything in the beginning was completely oral. And Jesus acted and accepted the common um, title of that time being rabbi. Now, you have to be careful because rabbis today are, quote, clergy, sort of. But rabbis in Jesus' time were not. They were lay people. It was an honor title. It didn't hold any actual authority. The, the authority was the priests, and most of the Pharisees, the rabbis, were not priests. Some were, but very few. So Jesus took those terms, but it's important. What we see throughout the Gospels a lot is... He teaches directly as a person who has absolute authority, right? If you don't believe he's God, he comes across as very arrogant, truly, because every other scribe would give their pedigree. <laughs> who was my teacher? Who was my teacher? And what is the opinion held by my school of rabbinic thought? Um, Jesus doesn't do that, right? He always says, you've heard it said, but I say, <laughs> you've heard it said, right, without in any way establishing any credibility beyond just do it because it's me. And so this was something that, um, that, that characteristic of Jesus is something that was acknowledged by all those who encountered him, whether they liked it. So for example, you have the people were astonished at his teaching, but he taught them as having authority, not as the scribes. They were amazed and asked one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority he commands even unclean spirits. But then, of course, you have the other side of the religious authorities who don't like it. In fact, near the end of his life, Jesus is directly asked by the Pharisees, where does your authority come from? Tell us, or the Sadducees. And Jesus kind of flips it on them, and he says, well, I'll answer your question if you tell me if John was really a prophet or not. Was he from God? Now, the Sadducees don't believe in prophets, so no, they didn't believe John was a prophet of God. But all the people there did, and so they knew if they publicly said that, it would look bad. So um, they didn't answer. But you have this, these two reactions to Jesus about his authority and his power. And I mean, we're still the same way today, right? I mean, even theologians today, they have to give you their pedigree. This is what Aquinas said. This is what, you know, look at all my footnotes. Jesus doesn't teach that way. He teaches absolutely as one who knows it from the inside out and has the authority to speak upon it. And he does a lot of innovative things. 
Yes, it's true he follows the law, but he most clearly steps outside the bounds of Judaism of his time. Uh, he claims the ability to forgive sins, something only God can do. He uh, modifies the kosher laws, the food rules. One that doesn't strike us as huge, but that's because we don't understand the Jewish background, is he declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, the one thing all religious Jews agree on and always have is the Sabbath observance. Even if you're almost an atheistic Jew, if you have any religious part of you at all, you obey the Sabbath. The Sabbath is literally embedded by God into creation. Therefore, it cannot be changed. The only one who could conceivably change it is, again, God. So when we look at these arguments about the Sabbath, most of us as modern Christians think, oh, it's just kind of arguing about how you use a religious day. It's not. It's not like our Sunday mass observance. The Sabbath is literally God's act in creation. It cannot be undone. So Jesus is constantly kind of revealing himself to be something more than just um, a rabbi, even a prophet, things like that. And as time goes on, we see that Jesus begins to um, transfer or share this authority, this power, with his apostles. Uh, now, the first document, written document, that we possess of Christianity is Paul's letter, first letter to the Thessalonians. It was written about 51 AD. It's the earliest Christian document. Remember, every single Paul's letters, all of them, were written before any gospel. So the Gospels didn't exist for most of the first generation of Christians. However, even as the writings begin to appear, the whole tradition up to this point being oral, of course they had the Old Testament, but the whole Gospel tradition is oral, the, the, the documents didn't replace the oral tradition. Instead, they existed side by side for a long time, and even when they existed side by side, however, it was the oral tradition that was considered the standard. So, for example, if you look on page 9, near the top, I have an indented paragraph that comes from the beginning of Luke's gospel. This is how Luke starts his gospel. And he explains his process, and he gives us a lot of information in this statement. He says, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and the ministers of the word have handed them down to us. I too have decided after investigating everything accurately anew to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize with the certainty of the teachings you have received. Now, if you look at Luke closely, and sometimes it's hard in English translation, but if you look at Luke closely, Luke tells us that it's the oral tradition that's the norm, not any writing, including his own writing. Right? He tells us the standard are those of the eyewitnesses from the beginning and the ministers of the word who see that term handed them on. That's the word paradosis in Greek. In Latin, the word is traditio, to hand on or to receive, it's the same word. So he says they're the tradition. In fact, he doesn't consider the gospels at this time to be the word of God. They're just narratives. Who's he talking about? Matthew and Mark, they were written before him. They just wrote narratives. They're nice, they help, but they're not the word of God at this point. And he clearly doesn't think his own gospel is the word of God. He says, all it is is um, an orderly sequence for you to understand the teachings better that you receive. So you see, even as the Gospels are being written and Paul's letters preceding them, the oral did not um, get replaced in any way as the Bible begins to come into being. And the thing that's important and that oftentimes non-Catholic Christians get wrong is that when we talk about tradition, we are something that, talking about something that comes from the apostles or through the apostles from Jesus, right? They are the words of God. It is the word of God, not the words of men. They want to equate anything of the oral tradition with this Pharisaic idea of customs in the Old Testament, and they're not the same thing at all. 
And so it's important to recognize that um, the apostolic tradition is the tradition of the church. And when I say it's the normative uh, standard, it makes sense because what would you base the gospels on? They can't testify to themselves as being accurate. If you, I read the Gospel of Mark, the first gospel written, how do I know it's true? Only because of the oral preaching, I already know. So the standard is not the written work. The written work itself is judged and de deemed to be authentic because it follows the apostolic tradition. So Jesus, in a sense, Jesus is the sum of all revelation, right? He is the word of God. The eternal word of the Father, who is the perfect image of the Father, that means he contains everything that the Father contains, the infinitude of everything. The only thing he doesn't have is fatherhood, because he's the Son, but otherwise he has everything. Therefore, in Jesus, God has revealed everything to the world. So in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, at the top of page 10, the first paragraph, the book of Hebrews starts with this. He says, the author says, In times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he spoke to us through a son, whom he made heir of all things, and through whom he created the universe, who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word. Right? In these last days, God has sent his son incarnate to reveal everything. He said everything in him. And that makes sense. Why? Because Jesus literally is everything. <laughs> He's the very creation, the uh, creator, the one who created the universe. So the church teaches this uh, on page 10, the, the big indented paragraph. It says, Christ, the son of God made man, is the father's one perfect and unsurpassable word in him he has said everything there will be no other word in giving us his son his only word he spoke everything to us at once in this sole word and he has no more to say because what he spoke before to the prophets in parts he has now spoken all at once by giving us the all who is his son so um, the first thing the church makes clear is, there is there's not going to be any more revelation, not public revelation. If anyone claims to surpass or to improve Jesus' revelation to the church, the church has been taught automatically that's false. So that would include Mormonism, which says there's a whole other book, three books actually, that replace and exceed the Bible. That would be Islam. And any of these different Christian sects and groups that come up that try to won over on Jesus. I mean, if you think of it in simple terms, it's this. Jesus is the infinite God. There's nothing more that can be said. <clears throat> what else can you say? And then the church warns us as a spiritual attitude in the last part of this quote. And this, this part of the quote actually is a direct quote from John of the Cross in the Catechism. It says, any person questioning God or desiring some vision or revelation would be guilty not only of foolish behavior, but also of offending him by not fixing his eyes entirely upon Christ and by living with the desire for some other novelty. What do, you want Jesus, what do you want God to reveal to you personally that he hasn't already done in Christ? The church is kind of saying, man up and do the work. It's all there in the Bible and the tradition. It's there. There's nothing new to be said. What do you think you're so special to ask God to give you something extra? First of all, there is no extra. And so rather than just obeying and looking to the tradition of the church, who is Jesus himself, the source, you're wanting something cool and interesting and exciting. Now, it's important to realize what the church is referring to here. On the one hand, it is not referring to the thing many of us do at different times, you know, give me a sign, help me understand this. That's trying to understand things that are going on in your life or things like that. They're talking about people 
if, if you go before the Lord in prayer and you say, I want to be a visionary like the three seers of Fatima, that's a sin. Really? No visionary ever picked being a visionary. None of them, right? None of them even expected it. The three children were children. You had Bernadette, who was ignorant and didn't really know much about her faith. You have Joan of Arc. The people who God chooses never ask for it. Never ask for it. And so to ask for it, to have some sort of something secret information is very dangerous in the spiritual life that the church is warning us about. Now that ties into another, another issue, and this I put in the footnote, but I want to cover it. If you go down the footnote on page 10, footnote 77, it's another big quote because I'm quoting directly from the catechism so you guys can see it sort of in black and white. And, and it ties in with what we're talking about, but then goes in a slightly different direction. It says, the Christian economy, therefore, since it is the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away. Right? There's never going to be another covenant. Christ is it. It'll be fulfilled and perfected at the end of time, but there won't be a new one. This is the new one. And no new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be nothing new God adds to our knowledge of Christ and himself until the second coming. Nothing. This is definitive by the church. Now, to be fair, this is held by almost every Christian church that I'm aware of. They may not have defined it as precisely, but they definitely believe that. Uh, almost every Christian church accepts the notion that Revelation ended with the death of the last apostle. Once John passes away, there's nothing new. It's only a under, deeper understanding of what's been given. And so that's what the church actually says next. It says, yet even if Revelation is already complete, it has not been made completely explicit. It remains for Christian faith to gradually grasp its full significance over the course of the centuries. Uh, and we'll see that in a little bit when we see some of the things that Jesus presents the apostles. So we don't learn anything new, but we unpack what has already been given, right? Everything that was given there in the gospel is there in that first, in Jesus and, and, and the 12. After that, there's nothing new, but there is a deeper understanding and unworking of all the things that he presented to the church through the apostles. So there is progression, but it's not new progression, it's organic. It comes directly out of what was there before. Like an acorn doesn't look anything like an oak tree, but anything that oak tree will ever be or can be is in that acorn. In the same way, the gospel is planted in that first century and it continues to grow, but it doesn't go off in weird directions and, and create its own thing. So now it addresses the question, Throughout the ages, there have been so-called private revelations, some of which have been recognized by the authority of the church. They do not belong, however, to the deposit of faith. In other words, they are not the word of God. They are not part of the tradition. It is not their role to improve or complete Christ's definitive revelation. If a seer tells you information that God didn't reveal, and I don't mean information about like historical things, like the whole idea of consecrating Russia and such. I'm talking about religious knowledge of the gospel. If a seer suddenly tells us, well, you also need this to be saved, or this is, <laughs> that seer's a liar, right? They're false. Um, because no private revelation can improve or complete the definitive revelation of God. The word of God is necessary for salvation. No private revelation, no matter how interesting, powerful in its effects, is ever necessary for salvation. None of them. So in that sense, they become part of the devotional life of the church. Instead, what is the role? Why does God send these private revelations? To help the church live more fully by it, that is by the big revelation, the big tradition, in a certain period of history. So Mary doesn't ever tell us anything new, for example. She never says anything new. Religiously speaking, what does she do? The same things, fast, pray, etc. Nothing new. Even the days she gives us aren't new. 
Wednesdays and Fridays, people go, ooh, now Wednesdays. Well, that's been true since the Didache, the second century of the church, that people fast on Wednesdays. I'm a Franciscan. I've never not fasted on Wednesdays since I've been a Franciscan. So it's not anything new. It's simply reaffirming certain aspects. Take the divine mercy. There is nothing Faustina tells us that the church didn't already know. But by bringing to the church's attention in a very visible way through the revelations given to her, then through her diary, the devotions that Jesus asked the church to adopt out of her, the hour of mercy, the mercy chaplet, then that truth of, of the word of God, the apostolic tradition, is now easier, more easily accessible and understood and, um, uh, and spread because of that devotion. But the devotion itself doesn't teach us anything new about God. Everything she says about mercy is right there in the Bible and the teachings of the fathers. So it's important to realize the difference between the two. And the church goes on to say, guided by the magisterium of the church, the census fidelium, that's the sense of the faithful, knows how to discern and welcome in these revelation whatever constitutes an authentic call of Christ or his saints to the church. Christian faith cannot accept revelations that claim to surpass or correct the revelation of which Christ is the fulfillment, as is the case in certain non-Christian religions and also in certain recent sects which base themselves on such, quote, revelations. So the church makes a very strict distinction between private revelation, which is not necessary for salvation, is not part of the deposit of faith, is not the apostolic tradition, not the word of God, and therefore not infallible, uh, and the public revelation, which is the word of God, which is part of the tradition, which is necessary for salvation, which is infallible. And so it, it makes this very strict dividing line uh, between the two to make it clear on where to focus sort of our attention. And that's not to denigrate or anything the ideas of public revelation. It's simply to recognize that um, the public revelation is what saves you. Now, if one particular devotion to a saint, to an apparition, to a particular practice helps you living out the big tradition, great. But it may not for someone else, and that's fine. It doesn't have any ultimate significance. Remember this, too. The church never guarantees that any revelation is true. That's not what they say when they accept a revelation like Fatima or Lourdes. They don't say it's true. They say there is nothing in it that goes against faith and morals, and there is no evidence that it's a fraud. That's a big difference than saying it's true. The church, why? Well, I just told you. The church can only define what? Faith and morals of the tradition. But by definition, those things aren't part of the tradition. Therefore, the church can't have infallibility on them. It only has normal human understanding. Still guided and helped by the Spirit, but not absolute. And therefore, it never can say for certain that this one is absolutely true, even though it allows some of these to be accepted. The actual number that have been accepted of those that have been put forth is minuscule. There's been hundreds just in the last decade, hundreds throughout the world. Maybe two or three of those might make it up the chain to finally be accepted. Um, the other ones are not. So it's important that when we're talking about the apostolic tradition, and maybe if you're understanding it yourself or talking to Protestants or Catholics who don't understand, who may be confused and trying to bring things like the rosary or the scapular in, um, those are not part of tradition in the big T. Those are devotions in the church. So they are not necessary for salvation or anything like that. Instead, what we see is that um, Jesus brings forth the idea now. At the Last Supper, as Jesus' end of his earthly life is coming near its conclusion, we see that the Lord begins talking a lot about what's going to happen afterwards. Uh, the Last Supper in John takes up multiple chapters because John records for us the teachings of Jesus on what's coming. And one of the things that he tells the apostles is that this tradition must constantly be ongoing 
fresh, alive, and it's made so by the presence of the Holy Spirit, which he and the Father will soon send upon the church. And so um, when that spirit is poured forth, the disciples won't just be disciples anymore. They'll actually become the church. The church's birthday is Pentecost, not the day when Jesus found the disciples, not the day of, of Easter, not Ascension. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. And when the spirit comes, then the beginning of the process of letting us understand that gospel in its fullness throughout each generation as they come, uh, that process begins at that moment. So, for example, at the top of page 11 here, um, about one, two, three, four, five lines down, Jesus begins to talk to the apostles about this. He says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit that the Father will send in my name, he will teach you everything and remind you of all I have told you. So notice, everything goes back to Jesus. The Spirit doesn't create new revelation. The Spirit reveals and keeps alive in the memory of the apostles, the church, in the teaching, the tradition, what Jesus taught. And so the Spirit will teach them everything. It'll bring out every nuance, every understanding, right? For example, the first century church did not have the devotion to Mary that we do. And that's not to say anything bad about it, it's just they didn't. Right? The example that Peter himself gives of the woman to follow is not Mary, it's Sarah from Judaism in his letters of St. Peter. Right? Only as time goes on and at Mary's death and as her understanding comes clear through living with John and then Paul giving the transmission to Luke, only as the centuries go on, it's already there from the beginning but only then, as time goes on, does the church really grasp the fullness of who she is and what she did. Right? It's not there from the very first moment. It's there, but it's not explicit. Uh, but then when you look back in this religious hindsight, you realize it's all there. You know, The mother of the incarnate word, the new creation, and the imagery that's used when the spirit comes on her as a new creation. It's Genesis respoken. Um, the fact that not only is she the mother of Christ, but she's the mother with the Holy Spirit, but she becomes the mother of the mystical body. That's why she has to be there on Pentecost, and, and so on and so forth. We'll talk about Mary in another class. Um, but so the Spirit is going to remind, he's going to take the words of Jesus and make them a constant living reality to us. Then a few moments later, he continues. He says, quote, a few more lines down, he says, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. But when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine, and for this reason I told you he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. So just a further explanation of everything in the tradition is Jesus' teaching and actions. The Spirit simply makes it alive, reveals to us the deeper significance, um, reminds us of it, right? Do this in memory of me to recall, worship, and celebrate these things. He does say two things, though, here uh, at the beginning that are important. One, I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. So one of the, the realities is, is apart from the Holy Spirit, we can, only, we can only possess at best a very superficial understanding of the revelation of Christ, who he is, what he taught, etc. It's the Spirit that enables us to even recognize that it's Jesus. Paul says, we can't even call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now this is literally true, even of the apostles. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to um, the B Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, the very last part where Jesus is commissioning them. Now, this is Matthew's um, very brief teaching on the ascension. And it starts with verse 16. Chapter 28, so it's the very last five verses uh, of the gospel. And so realize this, like picture in your mind what this is. This is the ascension. As we'll see in Luke, we'll look at his uh, in a moment, 
Jesus had already been risen from the dead. They had encountered him multiple times. And by this time, when the day he ascends, he had literally been with them 40 days straight. So the risen Christ has been with the apostles for 40 days. And yet, even then, they don't get it. So he goes to the Ascension Mount to ascend to heaven, and here's what it says. And this is Matthew admitting it. He was one of them, remember. The 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered him them. Look at verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Right at the cusp of the ascension, they don't get it. Until the Spirit comes at Pentecost, Peter does not understand the fullness of who Jesus is. Even after having seen him raised from the dead and spoken to the dead, quote, raised man for 40 days, still doesn't get it. He still doubted what's going on and what's happening. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit yet. The same thing is shown by Luke in the book of Acts. In the very beginning of Acts... You have a similar, it's not quite as glaringly, but it, it shows the kind of where the apostles are even after all this time. Uh, right in the very first chapter, he says, in the first book, Theophilus, and that's who he dedicated the Gospel of Luke to as well, I dealt with all Jesus did and taught until the day he was taken up, after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them by many proofs after he had suffered, appearing to them during the 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, about which you have heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So notice, 40 days. And so here's the ascension. When they had gathered together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? What? That's still their concern? To overthrow Rome? To create the political state of Israel? They still don't get it, right? No one gets it. Without the Holy Spirit, you literally cannot know Christ is God. It's impossible. And so, even more so, to the extent you... Um, surrender yourself to God's will and the Spirit, follow the um, teaching that he gives us and reminds us, celebrate the sacraments regularly, pray regularly, all these kind of things, the more you become able to understand and experience the tradition that's being talked about. So Jesus tells us that um, you can't bear it now. Without the Spirit, you don't get it. And the other thing he mentions is, I have much more to tell you. The fact that, or excuse me, he will guide you to all truth. So again, Jesus reaffirms, look, in the, through the centuries, God is going to continue through his spirit and my spirit to remind you of what I said, to bring this to your fullness of your attention, to understand it more, to live it out, etc. Then at the end of his, uh, or at the, his death and resurrection, Jesus then commissions those same apostles who will now receive the spirit. And he tells them, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, right? The whole tradition, the, the apostolic tradition, which is only oral at this point. So you have to teach them all of it. And then, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So with that, how did the church do that? And that's where we come to page 12, the apostolic tradition. Well, the first thing, and sometimes this shocks people, but it's interesting. The Bible itself never, first of all, the Bible itself never calls itself the word of God. The church is who calls the Bible the word of God, and only much later in history. Um, the term that are used in the, Old, in the New Testament, uh, you know, like synonymously, are gospel tradition, and word of God. You could just draw equal signs. They're all the same thing. Uh, that idea comes from the Old Testament because the term word of God, even the Jewish scriptures weren't called that till much later. The word of God is a living oral thing. When the prophet says, the word of the Lord said, he's not telling you something he wrote down. 
or that God wrote for him. He's telling you what God planted in his mind. So the term word of God refers uh, initially to the living, uh, speaking, prophetic power that God implants in certain people. Now, ultimately, as the New Testament will reveal, the word of God is, is the second person of the Trinity who became incarnate in the person of Jesus. So the Bible itself never refers to any of its writings as the word of God. The closest it comes is it, ca it caused something God breathed, but it's referring to the Old Testament, not the New Testament. Even, for example, I'll just read you one that's kind of interesting that you have to read all the way through to get it. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, the author talks about the word of God. And it sounds like maybe they're talking about what could be a book, if you interpreted that, until you get to a few verses. He says, indeed, the word of God is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating even between the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow, able to discern reflections and thoughts of the heart. And then it goes on. And here's where you realize it's not the book. No creature is concealed from him. So the word of God is Christ himself, not the Bible. And again, I'm not doing this to denigrate the Bible, but it's to understand it in its correct place. When you ask the Bible, where does truth come from? It tells you not the Bible, the church. So at the top of page 12, Paul says, quote, the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. I meant to include St. Augustine's famous statement from the Confessions, but I forgot as I was going on in writing. St. Augustine, you can, and you can, quote, you can probably uh, Google it and find it easily. St. Augustine's statement is this. I would not believe the Gospels at all had the Catholic Church not taught me they were true. Right? What authority does the Bible have apart from the Church? Sometimes you get the idea from some types of Protestants, that if you just, if anybody just walking down the street, you give them a Bible, they read it, they're just going to become converted. That almost never happens. Almost never. And there's nothing when you read that Bible that makes it explicitly better than, say, the Quran or the Hindu scriptures. In fact, a famous Jewish rabbi of the 60s and 70s, actually he passed away, I think, in the 80s, Abraham Heschel, um, very famous man, he actually started the civil rights movement in this country. Um, the civil rights movement was originally started by Jews under him, and then as the movement grew, he turned the leadership over to the African Americans because he felt they should represent themselves. But if you've ever seen the movie Mississippi Burning, which is a true story, you'll notice two of the three people killed are Jewish people, his followers. And Heschel um, wrote an incredible book that to my mind is the best book and he didn't write it as an academic although he's extremely academic he wrote it for popular people and a uh, popular reading it's just called the prophets uh, and he goes through the prophets and talk not like individually but he talks about what a prophet is how are they called what do they do you know and in his first chapter i'll never forget he sort of addresses this idea he says if you define religion from what our secular point of view. The Hebrew Bible, and by extension the Christian Bible, look the less, least likely to be religious. And he says, think about it. You open up the stories of Buddhism and Hinduism, everything's super philosophical and multiple worlds and this, and it's all like this high enlightened stuff. He goes, you turn to the Hebrew Bible, what is it? Food laws, rules about this, how you treat the poor. He goes, on the surface, that doesn't seem, quote, religious. Of course, the reason he gives is that's because humanity has fallen. So exactly what they think God is like and cares about is exactly the opposite of what he cares about, which is human beings, daily concern, care, etc. So the point of all this is, is just without the church, the Bible can't really stand on its own. Even people who are Christian who aren't Catholic and claim the Bible as their foundation only do so because unknowingly or knowingly they're actually relying on the church. 
For example, how do they know the Bible they have is even authentic? They can only look to the Catholic Church. There's no one else to have decided it. How can they decide? How do they know concepts like the Trinity, which is not in the Bible, because of the Church, the Catholic Church? So it's the Church ultimately um, that is the pillar and the foundation of the Church of the truth. And so John then and a lot of the other authors refer to the fact that this oral tradition was so important because you simply couldn't put it all down in writing, especially at once. So for example, on page 12, the indented paragraph, let's look at John, for example, St. John. He says, quote, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So John says, I had a lot to pick from, and I chose these 12. He goes on. It is this disciple who testifies these things and has written them, and we know his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. Right? And remember, John is writing his gospel after the other three. He already knows what they've written. And even with those three in his, he still says, not even scratching the surface. Not even beginning to scratch the surface. St. Paul refers to this oral tradition that he received from Jesus as the, quote, deposit of faith. You hear that term as a Catholic sometimes. Depositum fidei. And here's the phrase in which it comes from. In the, in the most modern New American Bible translation, it kind of throws it off by choosing a kind of different word, but the meaning's kind of clear. He says, he first tells Timothy, who is in our parlance today a bishop, he tells Timothy how to basically run his church in very uh, simple language. He says, tell them, the people entrusted to you, your parishioners in our day, to be rich in good works, to be generous, ready to share, thus accumulating as treasure a good foundation for the future so as to win the life that is true life. So Paul starts this whole passage using commercial language and, and, mo and money. Rich, treasure. So now he's talked about what you're supposed to tell the Christians how to live out the faith. But what about how do you know what is the, quote, treasure that you're supposed to be following? Well, he tells us, O oh, Timothy, Guard what has been entrusted to you. In the, in the older versions, it says, what has been deposited with you. Right? Another financial idea. God, the Spirit, through Paul, has deposited the oral tradition in Timothy. That's what he's supposed to teach. And in doing so, if he does that correctly, and the people follow it through living out the life of good works, etc., then they'll win the treasure of eternal life. So he uses all this commercial, monetary language, economic language to kind of make a statement. Paul likes that kind of language. In fact, at least four times, and I give some of the references down below, Paul calls the Holy Spirit that we get at baptism our down payment or first installment. Yes, they had that in the ancient world. That's not new. You didn't have enough to pay immediately. You put it on down payment. So every, Paul uses this same understanding. So now he's, he also connects the Holy Spirit with the tradition, etc. So what we see um, is that the deposit of faith cannot be simply identified with the Bible. The two, New Testament doesn't exist yet. It can't be defined by the four Gospels. They, don't, they haven't been written yet. The gospel that Paul is always talking about when he says the gospel, the gospel, he's never talking about the four gospel books. None of them were written until after he was dead. He's talking about the oral tradition he received from Christ personally. And that's the good news that was preached by, and lived by Christ, who is tradition itself, handed on to the apostles, to us, through them, and now guided the whole church by the Spirit. And so to kind of wrap up all the things that we've been talking about, the um, catechism, the church, on page 13, sort of in the upper middle part, 
says this, Christ the Lord, in whom the entire revelation of the Most High God is summed up. Right, we've talked about that. Christ is the Word. As the Word of God, there's nothing that wasn't said or could be said beyond him. He commanded the apostles to preach the gospel. And he fulfilled in his own person and promulgated with his own lips. So Jesus is the gospel, and then he also preaches it and acts it out in his humanity. So everything Jesus does is, quote, gospel. Then, in preaching, and notice with his own lips, nothing about writing again. In preaching the gospel, again, oral, preach orally, they were to communicate the gifts of God to all men. This gospel was to be the source of all saving truth and moral discipline. And so, turning to Paul now, we see that Paul tells his followers, his, those who, whose uh, churches he's founded, multiple times, and I can only, I only pull a few of them out, but he tells us that you receive the fullness of the gospel by following the apostolic tradition. So one of the famous quotes of Paul is near the bottom of page 13. He says, to this end, becoming holy, he, God the Father, has also called you through our gospel to possess the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, who's our in our gospel? The apostles. And we'll talk about that later. John will make a big connection with this later. It's not ordinary Christians. We're not all the ones who teach. We can recognize the gospel, but we don't determine the gospel as laity. And then he tells them, Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. So Paul is telling us that um, the, the tradition is oral, but in, at least in Paul's ministry, we know he would write letters to often remind them. And if you actually look at a lot of Paul's letters, you see that he refers to something he had told them orally previously. He'll say, don't you remember I told you when I was with you? I say now, and I said it again with tears, blah, blah. Like Paul constantly refers to the fact that this was all oral, but then later, as time permits, uh, he's forced to write letters to these communities because he can't travel to all of them all the time. But the point being, hold fast to the whole tradition, whether it comes through sacred scripture, the letters, or whether it comes through the, the uh, sacred tradition, the oral statement. They're of equal value in every way. So a few more things just really quickly where he commands us to obey the tradition. On page 14, the first regular paragraph, he says, quote, we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to shun any brother who conducts himself in a disorderly way and not according to the tradition they received from us. For you know how one must imitate us. Again, the us is always the apostles. Now here, he goes on the opposite extreme. He says, look, if there's anyone who calls themselves a brother, but is not living according to the, quote, tradition, you're to shun him, right? Excommunicate him, which Paul does later in the letter. Because that person's not really one of you. He doesn't follow our tradition. He follows his own tradition. Um, and that's an issue that he had to, to um, struggle with a lot. Because at the time that Christianity is born, there was a lot of what's called syncretism. Uh, there's a lot today. Uh, the New Age movement is nothing new. In the ancient Greco-Roman world, the idea of religion was you picked and choose, right? You found this religion from your Greek upbringing. You found this thing from the mystery religions of Egypt. You liked this philosopher, and you kind of mixed your own thing together. And so Christianity in, the, in those early stages as it entered into the Greco-Roman world had a hard time because people would take it, they liked the religion, then they wanted to add things to it. And so a lot of times the apostles are constantly referring or refuting this. The other thing that might be odd is notice how the apostles are themselves models of the gospel. Notice he says, 
you know how one must imitate us. Right? Not only did I preach you the tradition, but like Jesus, I am the tradition in how I live it out. Wish we had bishops like that today, right? Hmm. Some, very few. So the, God, the, the, the apostle themselves is supposed to be the model of what Christ is, not just by what they tell them, but by how they live it out, right? And Paul died just like Jesus did for the gospel. Peter died literally just like Jesus did, crucified for the gospel. And so you see it again and again. The very, just two lines down, he says it again. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now that sounds arrogant, until you realize, as we'll look at in a little bit, I think in the second half, what the apostle and who an apostle is. And hold fast to the traditions just as I handed them on to you. And then again, keep on doing what you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me. Then the God of peace will be with you. So notice, you follow the apostolic tradition, which also in a very real sense means you follow the apostles. And so the New Testament authors clearly witness to the apostolic tradition, the oral one, as being the very word of God. So, for example, on page um, uh, 15, the second paragraph, after the middle part of, there's the middle bold part right after it is a quote, Here's Paul again. Now I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel preached by me, so completely oral at this point, the letter he's referring to is telling them what happened. The gospel preached by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a human being, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? This is not another human religion that's man-made. It's not a philosophy. It's what I literally receive from Christ himself and I now pass on to you. And so because of that, to keep the gospel in its integrity in pristine condition was a major factor of the early church's struggle. So if you go down to the indented paragraph on page 15, you see one of the two big places where Paul really addresses this. He says writing to the Galatians. And what's happened is Paul went and he evangelized Galatia. As he always did, he stood, stayed there for some time, then left, left some people in charge, ordained presbyters, quote, priests. And then he left, and in that time period, others came in, and they started saying you had to do other stuff beyond what Paul said. And he hears about it, so he writes a letter, and he's angry. He's angry not just that people came in and did this, these people who are themselves syncretists, but claiming to be Christian missionaries. He's actually madder at the community because they should know better. They should, he shouldn't have to address this issue. They should have kicked him out when they came. So here's what he says. I am amazed that you are so quickly forsaking the one who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Not that there is another. But there are some who are disturbing you and wish to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, and I now say again. So see, he had warned them before. He's telling them, remember? If anyone preaches to you a gospel other than the one that you received, let that one be a curse, right? Paul says, I don't care if it's a human or an angel. If they disagree with the tradition we taught you, they're false. Therefore, let them be damned. That's what he literally says. A curse says, anathema sit. Let them be damned because they're leading you astray. Um, in another place, in 2 Corinthians, I'll do this one, then we'll take our break. If you have a Bible, I didn't write it in here, but if you have your Bible, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul deals similarly, but now with the Corinthian church. So second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 11, and Paul says uh, this. Verse uh, 2. He says, I am jealous of you with the jealousy of God, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
Now here you see the mediator role of the apostle, which is now the bishop and their delegate, the priest today, right? You have the groom, who is Christ. You have the bride, who is the community. And the one who links them is the apostle. Notice, he doesn't use the term here, he does in another place. Who is he? He's kind of like the father of the bride. That's why he's embarrassed, right? He's saying, I presented you, this community, this parish, to your spouse as a virgin. But then look at the next verse. He says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, right, ruined the first marriage, your thoughts may be corrupted from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ, right? I'm afraid you're becoming an adulteress. That's what he's really saying. You also have the idea of spiritual fatherhood here, right? In the Old Testament, the priests are always called father. Um, in the New Testament, Paul always refers to himself as the father of Titus and Timothy. Read the beginning of when he's writing to them. He always says, I'm your father, you're my true son. And then, I don't know if it's Corinthians. Here he alludes to the fact he is a father, because that's who would have control of the bride to introduce to the groom. But in another place, Paul explicitly tells us his role as an apostle is that of a father. Hence why we call him father. He says, you have had many teachers in Christ, but you only have one father. I am your father through the gospel. Right? You have a lot of people who have added and helped explain and tell you what I taught you, but I'm the one who brought you to Christ, therefore I'm your father. And John also uses the term unanimously, right? He talks about fathers, young men, young uh, fathers, um, young men, and sort of middle-aged men. And he uses those terms, those terms are symbolic, not literal. So this idea. Now, what had they done? Well, like Galatia, they should know better. Here's what he says, verse 4. This is why I'm afraid, he's saying, why I'm afraid you might have become corrupted. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it well enough. Right? Nothing, he's saying. Someone comes in, teaches you something that we didn't tell you about Jesus, or you need a different spirit, or the teaching is not the same, and you just go, oh, okay. Paul's kind of flabbergasted. He's like, really? I mean, he would die today, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> The ignorance of the church today, all most Christians, not just Catholics by any means. I mean, think about, for example, it's been years now. Think about how much traction the Da Vinci Code got. You could Google most of the stuff in there in moments and find out it's false. I was at a meeting. Some of you know I'm the ecumenical uh, director of San Diego for the diocese. And we were at a meeting with some rabbis and... I forget who else, it's been years now. And it was about six months after that book had come out, or maybe right when the movie, something had happened. It was either the book was, had become really popular or the movie was about to be made. And in the discussion, this rabbi uh, from Beth Israel was really interesting. He said, he said, I'm Jewish and I know it's not true. He says, but you, Christians really have a problem if this many people who claim to be your faith don't understand the most basic things about it. And he was right. right? There's, it's bad. I mean, and every Easter and every Christmas, what happens? You go to Barnes & Noble, they have the Christmas books up. Half of them are telling you Jesus wasn't really God, wasn't this, wasn't that. Easter time, oh, look at our, Christian or our Christmas or Easter selection. He didn't really rise from the dead. It's this, it's a... And we shouldn't fall for that, right? We should know. We should know. And the more you become in tune with the tradition, the more you understand it, the more it makes sense, the more you live it in your own life, the more you experience it, the less you're going to be led astray. But 
Paul is kind of um, amazed that this occurs uh, to Christians who should know better, right? Know better. So let's go ahead and take our break, and then we'll come back, and we're almost done with this part, and we'll look at the magisterium. How does the magisterium help us in understanding the tradition? Okay, we're almost done with the apostolic tradition, and that'll bring us to sort of modern or every time since. Um, I especially want to look at how Paul refers to some of the most important truths of our Christian faith as part of tradi oral tradition. At the top of page 16, you see two bullet points, the Eucharist and the resurrection. In both cases, Paul sets out the chain of custody, so to speak, of the tradition, the oral tradition. Remember, none of this is written yet. Um, so let's look at the Eucharist. This is what Paul tells them. Quote, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. So the word tradition occurs twice there. I traditioned, paradosis, from the Lord what I also traditioned to you. Right? It's the process and the content. How it happens. And did. So notice, Christ gave it to the apostle. The apostle now gives it to the community. Also remember this. I told you none of the Gospels had been written yet. That means Paul's letter here is the earliest written account we have of what happened at that Last Supper. So it's the Mass, right? He tells us this is my body. This is all these. Things. Paul's the earliest evidence we have. And he's clearly not quoting from a book. He's quoting from memory. But the point being, the Eucharist itself, he doesn't. Uh, he reminds them, this is part of the living tradition of which you are now an heir of and a link in. I received it from Christ himself, and now I handed it on to you. Now, in the resurrection one, he's even more specific because that is the central foundation of our faith. He says, quote, For I hand it on to you, so I tradition to you, as of first importance, what I also, what I also, tradition. And then he tells us it. Christ died for our sins in according with the scripture, accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The scriptures are always the Old Testament he's referring to. And then he appeared. And in this case, he actually tells us the order and importance of the appearances. He appeared to Cephas. Who's that? That's Peter. And we can tell how old this is because he uses the actual Aramaic word in Greek. Kepha is rock. That's what Jesus would have said. Cephas is a transliteration, not a translation. A transliteration is when you take a word and you transfer the whole word into another language. Right? It may pronounce it slightly differently, but you put the whole word over. Um, Peter, Petros, is a Greek written translation of the word in Aramaic. So we see by calling him Cephas, this is old. This is before the word Peter even really is there yet, which makes sense because even at the time Paul is writing to the Corinthians and you do have a lot of Gentiles, the tradition would have already long been set. So he says, he appeared first to Peter, Cephas. We have no idea when that happened. Right? It's not told us in the scriptures. We don't have that account. Although Luke says the same thing. If you remember the story of the two uh, disciples on the way to Emmaus, mm -hmm. they encounter Jesus. They realize it's him when he does a Eucharistic type thing of breaking the bread. He disappears and they know it's him. And they, take, they run all the way back to Jerusalem. And it's kind of a funny story because these poor guys are so excited only to be deflated. They get there. They're like, we've seen the Lord. And what do their apostles say? Yeah, he already appeared to Peter. That's what they say. But again, we don't have, other than the statement, when that happened, the first one we have is the apostles as a group. And that's the second one. He says, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now, Paul adds that part to the tradition. You can actually take out where it's easy to figure out where Paul has added his own stuff. Why does he say that? Go ask them. Right? If you don't believe me, go ask them. They'll all verify they saw the risen Lord. After that, he appeared to James, 
Then to all the apostles, notice the 12 and apostles are not synonymous. There's only the 12 or the 12. The apostles are the larger group that Jesus commissions personally in his resurrected self to send forth. Last of all, as to one born abnormally, he appeared to me. But in each case, he's showing us the oral tradition of, that becomes the basis for our Bible and everything else. So once the Bible is written down, then it becomes extremely normative and important, right? But it's not, it, even to this day, it's not the sole focus that Catholics and the church uses for its um, understanding of the faith. But we each become this link in the chain. And there's a statement the church uses, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. Now, on the ecclesial, the church level, what does that phrase mean? It means that the liturgy is the ultimate source of our faith. I mentioned the Bible isn't called the word of God till much later. It is called the word of God later because of its use in the liturgy to proclaim the good news of Jesus. So in other words, the reason the Bible is the Bible, the New Testament, is because they preached it at their mass, just like we do today. And over time, you said, this book works, this one doesn't, these are good. And so the church decided and determined, based on its own apostolic tradition, what was true, right? It's, it's the source of our morals. You're given the homily, you're told what to do. We kind of miss it at the end of Mass now, right? Ite misa est. The, our whole celebration is named after the very last statement we say. Go, you are sent. Mass comes from the word missio, mission. Right? You've received the body and blood of Christ. Now go out and feed the world. Not go watch the football game, go shop. But I mean, you know. But the point being, it's supposed to be a commissioning at the end of each celebration to go forth and share what you've been given. And what happens in the, in the sacraments? Union with Christ, right? So it may sound funny at first, but even the Bible is is used ultimately in the liturgy. That's where it was primarily used. Remember, nobody could read. You had a few people in the community who would proclaim it, and everyone else just had to hear it and listen to it. That's why, especially in the Old Testament, it can be hard to read because it repeats itself five times in three verses. Why? Because you have to realize only a, a very few percentage can read. They're saying the same thing over and over so all the audience can remember it. Right? So even the Bible was written to be uh, proclaimed. Not, no one wrote the Bible thinking people would sit down and read these letters individually and personally study them. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever, but that wasn't how it was written or why it was written. So what it means is our belief, what we believe, comes from what we worship. Right? So when in the Mass, you can see what Catholics worship. We believe in a trinity that we proclaim. We believe in Jesus who is incarnate, uh, who rose from the dead, who died, who rose, is in glory, who will come again. We believe that we're destined for union with God to share in the divine nature because the Eucharist makes us one. We believe that what happens in miniature in the Mass, the body of Christ, we consume it, we become the body of Christ, is what Jesus will one day do to the whole creation unendingly, right? God will be all in all. So if the liturgy is done well and performed well, that's the source ultimately of what we believe. Now, the term can also be taken in a more personal sense, which is used in like spiritual direction. And in that sense, it means this. You can tell me whatever you want to say you believe, but if I ask you about your prayer life and your devotions, I'll be able to tell you what you really believe. So I might say this or that, but if I look at your prayers or you look at your own prayers and you always address God by a, a few titles and never address him by other ones, you don't really accept those titles. Why? Do you not like to call him Lord? Right? Are you too rebellious? Do you not like to call him? Do you call him mother, which is forbidden? Right? Your words prove what you really believe because you're going to pray based on what you want. So you might say you believe God does miracles, but you never pray for them because in belief you really don't think he does it. Maybe in the past. Right? So in a sense, what we pray 
reveals who we really are, what our real faith is. Um, but in the larger sense, in the sense the church means it for the church, is um, the liturgy is what instructs us ultimately in what the church believes because it is the source of everything because it literally is our connection with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, just to give you a little preview, I decided to separate one very short part, only six pages, from my larger talk on the sacraments. And so next week, a single class, it'll just be one session, I'm going to talk about the Mass and the Book of Revelation. Because the, that's what the Book of Revelation is. It's the Mass, right? 22 chapters, the first 11, the Liturgy of the Word. Seven sealed books, seven letters written, right? It's all word, word. The last uh, 11 chapters, all about the liturgy of the Eucharist. Chalices filled with blood, the hidden manna, the tree of life. And not to mention everything that we pray in the mass comes from John's experience of revelation. The holy, 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 sursum corda, lift up your hearts, the alleluia, all those things from John's book of revelation. Now in the book of revelation, which is his experience of the mass, he also has these cycles, four cycles of sevens. Um, and, that's, and the four cycles have to do with the four emperors who he's lived under, Nero, Titus, Vespasian, and Domitian at the time he's writing. And um, four events that occur, three of them occur within the, that historical moment, and then a fourth one. So the persecution under Nero, the Jewish, Jewish war, which is fought through Nero, Titus, and Vespasian, which ends with the destruction of the temple. The uh, persecution under Domitian, which is what John is personally experiencing. That's why he's been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Uh, and then ultimately he uses those to point to us what the, end, what the judgment on the world will be like. Not, not in particulars, but in the general sense using God's judgment of his own city, Jerusalem. So if you want to know what the judgment on the world will be like in general, John is saying, look at these events, and that'll tell you. Um, but John's point of all of it, because through every few chapters, he'll have a, a, a break where either the saints or the angels will collect all this incense, which he tells us each time he mentions it. He says, these are the prayers of the faithful below. And they present it to God. And then God takes things and he fills things with fire and he gives it to the angels and the saints. And they throw it upon the earth. What is John's point? The mass is what governs all human history. And so the, math, the, the book of Revelation isn't actually that hard to understand once you grasp the code. Um, and so next week I'm just going to touch on one small part of the book, which is it really is the mass. Um, that was why John primarily wrote it, because he was in exile. It occurs on a Sunday. It's all one day. It occurs on a Sunday, which normally he would be celebrating the Mass, but he can't because he's by himself in exile. So he has this experience of the vision, and God lets him see the heavenly liturgy of which we're connected to on earth. So that ties into the Lex Credendi, as well as the sacraments that we'll talk about in um, more detail afterward. And we end this part, moving into the magisterium, with this last sentence on page 16, heading over to 17. Uh, Paul tells Timothy, You, my child, notice the fatherhood image again, You, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me, through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people, who will have the ability to teach others as well. So, the point here is what? Because can you argue, therefore, that since we wrote the Bible down, no, we don't, now we don't need the oral tradition? No. Because a lot of stuff, as Peter, or as John and others tell us, isn't in the Bible. But we are to teach the whole truth, written and oral. And notice what Paul says here. Paul, the first generation apostle, is telling Timothy, a second generation apostle, to teach the third generation of apostles 
who themselves will teach others. Right? The ongoing line, the links of, um, of tradition. Now, just like we end this part, just like the, the first part on Judaism, just like the oral tradition of Judaism, the Catholic oral tradition, with one tiny exception that I'll mention in a moment, has now been pretty much written down. So where do you find it? Where is the, quote, oral tradition of the church, oral apostolic tradition? Well, it's found in the decrees of the popes and councils who take the various deposit and need to make statements and clarifications on specific issues. It's found in the liturgical books of the church, which we have going back to almost the first century, the Didache being the first one, written maybe as early as 70 AD, earlier than some of the, the biblical writings. The Didache is a how-to book. That's why it probably wasn't included in the Bible. It doesn't say anything different than the Bible, but it would be like including the Missal in the Bible, right? It tells you like, here's how you baptize. Here's the type of water you use. So the church didn't use that in the Bible because that was just how it was practiced. But so those liturgical documents, the inscriptions found on ancient Christian tombs and sacred pieces, right? So in the catacombs in Rome, which go back to the first century, right? Especially those surrounding the tomb of Peter. Um, there's graffiti all over those walls. And a lot of the graffiti is asking these dead saints, dead people, Peter and the others who are buried there, to pray for them. And also asking that their, their loved ones who have died receive mercy in the next world. In other words, the graffiti is so is so definitive that they believed in the saints' intercession after death and that they believed that there was a place that later will come to be called purgatory after death is all over the place, right? It's older than when the Bible was fully written. So it's old, so that's proof of tradition. And then, um, of course, the writings of the fathers of the church of whom came the creeds and then the various acts of the martyrs that were recorded by witnesses, that what they proclaim, what they say, etc. So that's where the tradition is kind of found now. With one tiny exception, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's more confusing than anything, and it's very kind of volatile in Catholic uh, academia, but that is what's called the, quote, secret tradition. Right? It's already exciting sounding. Now, what is this? Well, to go back, we have to realize that um, throughout the Old Testament, you have these experiences, starting first with Adam, then Abraham, Isaac, uh, Moses, others, where they experience being caught up to heaven, really, face to face with God. They're caught up in this experience. Um, some of the most famous ones are men like Elijah, uh, Enoch, who were literally taken alive and never returned to earth. Right? They were taken alive, but unlike Moses, who saw God, who was brought to heaven at the top of Mount Sinai, and the elders, their return, um, some are. The term for Jewish spirituality and mysticism prior to the 13th century, A.D., the term for it used by scholars is Merkaba. The word means literally chariot because the different people experience seeing God in some connection with a chariot. So if you go back and you look at the story of Elijah, what happens? A chariot sweeps down and takes him right out of view and he's gone. And Elisha goes, my God, the chariots of Israel in heaven. And he never returns. When you see, you look at Daniel's vision, Isaiah's, and especially Ezekiel's. When they see God, God sits on a chariot throne. In other words, his throne has wheels that are made of angels and the fire. So the terminology came to be called the Merkabah. What is understood is this, is after Moses' experience on Sinai, and he is given this vision, um, throughout the book of Exodus, you keep seeing God referring to it, but it's never actually explicit what he's talking about. He just keeps saying, do it according to what I showed you on the mountain. 
do this according to the vision you were given on the mountain. Do this. So Moses has this specific part of the oral Torah that is not passed on to the whole community, but is kind of kept in order to um, the highest kind of level of spirituality as people may be near that. So throughout the centuries, this was held by the priestly classes. And you can go to the Jewish encyclopedia and look it up, and they'll talk about the, the Merkabah tradition and how the priests held it. And, since the, and it was all liturgical, right? Just like we believe with the Mass, in the Mass, what we'll talk about next week, in the Mass, and the Bible itself in the book of Hebrews is clear on this, um, when we join in the Mass, especially at that moment when we invoke the Holy Spirit, as soon as the Holy Spirit is invoked, the very next thing we say is we join the angelic hymn with all the thrones, dominions, etc. That's not words, pious words. That means at that moment, the Spirit has joined the liturgy on earth to the liturgy in heaven. We are singing the same things the angels sing. So in the same way, back in Judaism, there was the understanding that the priest had an understanding by which a person could... Um, ascend, so to speak, even while physically alive here, to encounter the Lord, right? To have visions, revelations, etc. Now, that ends up being shared with the prophets. And then finally, by the time of Jesus, Jesus, who we've already mentioned, is the source of all revelation. Jesus very much sort of introduces this to his apostles. However, it's still kept relatively... Secret isn't the word because it's not secretive in that sense, but um, Jesus gives the apostles the ability to experience that same thing. So we have Paul, who suddenly out of the blue in 2 Corinthians tells us, I was caught up to the third heaven, and I saw God. I was caught up to paradise, that's the Garden of Eden, now in heaven. And I heard ineffable things, and then an angel came and beat me and all these things. It's completely Jewish idea, right, that Jesus passes on. John's whole book of Revelation is that, caught up. The thing that we don't realize is that was the common experience of all Christians that were taught how to do that. So Jesus passes that on, and we're told um, by Eusebius, the, great, the first church historian, at the top of page 18, he says, quote, James the righteous, John and Peter were entrusted by the Lord after his resurrection with the higher knowledge. They imparted it to the other apostles and the other apostles to the 70. So one, this wasn't universally taught. Only a select group of people were given this information. Two, it was given by Jesus after his resurrection. It was nothing he taught them while he was here on earth in his three-year ministry. And three, it's composed of some kind of higher, secretive, spiritual knowledge. And then it kind of goes underground, and you only see it referred to here and there in the writings of the church fathers, but they all refer to it at some point. So I just gave you a couple examples, like right down in the middle of page 18. Here's St. Dionysius. He says, quote, this is the kind of divine enlightenment into which we have been initiated by the hidden tradition of our inspired teachers, a tradition at one with scripture. We now grasp these things in the best way we can as they come to us wrapped in the sacred veils of that love toward humanity with which scripture and the hierarchical traditions cover in truth the, tr in tr the truths of the mind with things derived from the realm of the senses. So this is something other than the apostolic tradition or the Bible. This is something more. Now, both refer to it, but never fully. They hint at it. Um, and one of the things is the tradition was not to be shared with everyone, but only to those properly initiated who could handle it. And for this reason, in the early church, John's letters, writing, and book of Revelation were not usually read publicly because it wasn't believed that most Christians could understand it. Looking at how people were still in our modern times understand Revelation, they were right. But under pressure, those books were put to the official documents of the church. But 
um, there is this tradition. Now, what is it? Because you're talking, uh, well, here's the, here, what's what he said about the initiation. See to it that you do not betray the holy of holies, that your respect for the things of the hidden God be shown in the knowledge that comes from un the intellect and is unseen. Keep these things of God unshared and undefiled by the uninitiated. Now, so I don't spend too much time on this. I'll just mention it this way. What this knowledge consists of is quite a few things, but I'll just list what it would contain. It explains the structure of the universe spiritually, right? When Paul throws out that phrase, the third heaven, no one knows what he's talking about. Right? I only know because of a lot of study and stuff. Third heaven, what are they talking about? Are there more than one heaven? Lots. Right? And just very briefly, you because I don't want to get caught up too much in this. The lowest worlds is called Asiya. It means action. All the action takes place here. And Asiya has two parts to it. The physical universe. I said physical, not material. So that would include the quantum realm and all the crazy things we're only just starting to scratch the surface of. And it would also have the spiritual uh, aspect. And the spiritual aspect of this world has seven heavens. Sometimes you'll hear that term, right? Seven heavens. You don't know where it comes from. But that's the least of all of them because above it in succession are other worlds, heavens. Buri, oh, so Yitzra, which means formation. That's the world of the higher angels. That's where the Garden of Eden is, where Paul is caught up to. You have above that Beria, which means creation. That's where, that's the place at which God first brought forth things out of nothingness and they start to form in this world. Then you have Atzilut, which means emanation. That's just God's energy as it's pouring into creation from his infinite transcendence beyond. Above that, you have the chaos, the darkness that everyone has to pass through, right? The dark night of the soul, etc. That's tohu wabohu from the book of Genesis. The earth was formless and void. That's the place of chaos. And then above that, the Jews called the highest world of creation Adam Kedmon. It literally means the primordial man, which is interesting because what it means to, even in Judaism, as monotheists before Jesus, they believed that the ultimate expression of God in creation, this is not God as he is himself, but as he enters creation, is in the form of a human being. And that's what Paul refers to, right? That's Christ. He's the cosmic Christ. Everything was created in, through, with, for him. And so you have these, this vast thing. And then within this, you have all the demonology and the choirs of angels and what they do and how to summon them and what each one's you know, power is. And um, the fact that a human person is a temple. That's why we have three parts, body, soul, spirit, because the temple had three parts, the outer court, the inner tabernacle, the uh, the outer tabernacle, the inner tabernacle. There's all the mysteries of the deeper mysteries of the sacraments. There's how to access paranormal, quote, powers. The main way in which the secret tradition is used today, in which you have come into contact with it, are the various techniques of deep contemplation and meditation, which have become more widespread. Um, the Catholic Encyclopedia tells us that in the 13th century, the same time at which Merkaba ceased to be called that anymore, in the 13th century, we see something happen within Christianity. And what happens is that for some in the church, this secret tradition should be ended because it's, quote, Jewish. So, in the 12 and 1300s, you have this battle that goes on. And basically what happens, the Catholic Encyclopedia tells us, is that the secret tradition 
um, becomes more normalized through two chains of transmission. One chain of transmission is the um, spiritual interpretation of the Bible. One part of it is there. And that's where you have, and most modern spiritual, scriptural scholars know this, but at one time it was very secretive. What is that? Well, it's all the gematria. That is, every word stands for a letter and a number and this and that. And you can <laughs> move them around and have the same word, read it backwards to different words, all kinds of crazy things. So that was one. One kind of went in the mainstream of scholarship. And what they called it in the Middle Ages, they actually called the secret tradition prophecy, which can be confusing because they're not talking about the charismatic gift of prophecy and they're not talking about Old Testament prophecy. They call it prophecy because it's handed on word of mouth. It's not written down. Um, and then the other place it ended up was in the religious orders. So, for example, in the Benedictines, the Benedictine fourfold idea of rhythm, right? That the Benedictine seeks to enter into the rhythm of creation. So you have ora et labora, pray and work, but you also have study and relaxation. And it seems very simple, but it was part of sort of this idea of knowing the structure of how things work. My own, the reason I became interested in it and why I like it so much is the Franciscan tradition became the huge purveyors of it. Um, the Franciscan tradition stood up when the church was, tr many people in the church were trying to burn the Jewish books because by this time the Jews had written down the Merkaba, and it's still with us today. But when the Franciscans looked at it, they said, this is what we believe, except we just put Christ into the mix to understand the fullness of it. Therefore, the Franciscans became known for keeping at their friaries the books that today we call Kabbalah, because that's the Merkaba tradition. And did the church believe in it? A hundred percent. That's why Bonaventure uses terms like emanation and why he talks about um, France of Assisi is the divine man who has, who was taken up in the chariot. He talks about all the same things, right? Francis encountered God like they did in the Old Testament. An angel came, struck him, pierced him so that he actually was wounded, right? Paul is wounded when he sees it. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on in this, in this idea. And so the Franciscan tradition has always been its main focus since Francis is the, the Franciscan tradition doesn't have a, quote, ministry, right? Some, minist some Dominicans are teachers. Some are medical people, a lot of the sisters. What is the Franciscan one? We don't have one. So what is our purpose? The purpose of the Franciscans given by our founder is simply this to experience God here and now in the rawness and power that was experienced in the first generation of Christians in John the Baptist and people like him. There's a term for it, the spirit in its youthfulness, euvenens. And I want to experience that here and now. And I will use every means at my disposal to have that encounter with Christ except for sin. I will do whatever it takes. What if it leads to your death? So be it. Right? What if it leads to this or that? So be it. So it's all the things of fasting and ascesis. And whenever you use the term mystical, this is what you're talking about. But what it's mostly thought of today would be, as I mentioned, what you guys would know it as primarily is the mystical tradition. So what does John of the Cross teach about contemplation? Think of Teresa of Avila. She the whole idea of, I told you, the people are a temple. Why do you think she calls the human person the interior castle? Right? With all the different rooms, all of which are different levels of prayer. See, because it was, it was kind of brought forth through the religious orders, and then through the religious orders, it's trickled down to the church in general. But that's all I really want to say, because it gets too confusing and weird. But, and it's not necessary for salvation, which is why it's not a... It's cool, but it's not necessary. In fact, it's dangerous. That's why the church sort of keeps it down because 
I know in our day and age, technological, modern times, we kind of scoff at the idea of like, oh, the spiritual realm. I mean, we believe in God and stuff, but we don't really understand the spiritual realm. And that ignorance is very dangerous. So even doing things as simple as chanting the um, uh, Jesus prayer, the prayer of the heart, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And to enter into that meditative state, you have to realize you're putting that out there into a universe, and I mean not just our universe, the spiritual universe, where there are a lot of things that are spiritual and not the least bit sacred, who will answer if you're not really on board. And so that's why it's always, the mystical life is always preceded first by deep asceticism, you know, learning control of your body. Uh, centering prayer would be a modern reworking of part of it. And if you've read some of Father Keating's works, he'll say strange things. You might pass it by as you're reading, but he talks about the fact that our bodies, and he's, he's really quoting the, sacred, the secret tradition, he says, our bodies are like a lightning rod for God. That's why there are postures for prayer that are better than others. There are ways to pray with your hands. There are ways to clear your mind, um, or we don't clear our minds, but we focus our mind, but clear it of the sinful things so that the Lord can actually, that, that the Holy Spirit can sort of uh, go through you without any hindrance or obstacles that he would normally face. So it's all over the place. It's just kind of... Um, diffused now throughout the church. All right, we only have a couple minutes, so I'm not going to be able to pull off the last part. So I just want to mention a couple things. The magisterium. The word simply means teaching church. And what we find in Jesus is this specific power given to the apostles, his power given to the apostles. Not every Christian, the apostles. So at the Last Supper on page 20... He comes and he appears after the resurrection. He says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them, said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. So a chain of command is established here. That's in fact where they first really become the apostles. The Father sent me, the word apostoline, Send. And I now send you. And you now go out to those who will hear the message. And notice, he gives them real power. Whose sins you forgive? Whose sins you retain? Yeah, they have to do what Jesus would do but they're the doorway by how it happens. John is even more specific. Um, please read these pages because I think they're very important for the whole thing. But um, go to page, where is it? Ah. Oh, sorry, it's on the same page, 20. Next to the last paragraph, the bold part. This is John writing in his first letter. He says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our own eyes, what we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerns the word of life. For the life was made visible. We have seen it and testify to it. Again, who's we? The apostles. the apostles. It's not the Christians he's talking to. Because the same is true of us. Did any of us see Jesus? touch him, not the literal walking Jesus, the incarnate Christ, none of us did. They did. Only they did. Therefore, they can testify to it. And then look what he says. A lot of people don't like this, but it's very clear. That life was made visible. We have seen it, testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was made visible to us, us the apostles. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim now to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, for our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, do you notice something? Because it's something we don't, it makes people uncomfortable sometimes. Who has fellowship with God? 
Look at what John actually says. Who has fellowship with God in Christ? The apostles. Therefore, if you want fellowship with Christ, you have to have fellowship with us. That's why he says that you may have fellowship with us for our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. The point, <laughs> you can't cut them out of the equation. Can't do it. In order to know him, it has to pass through them. Because they're the only ones who can verify it. Even the Bible. Why do we say the Bible's true? Because the apostles told us it was. So the apostles are absolutely necessary. Um, in fact, what Jesus talks about a little bit later, top of page, uh, let's jump to... Bottom page 21. Here's Jesus now. Same thing. Whoever listens to you, the apostles, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. And if you reject me, you reject him. Right. Without the apostolic tradition and testimony... You don't have a leg to stand on with God. It's the apostles who are the only link we have in every direction, right? If you want to think of it up to heaven, it goes the Father, to Christ, to the apostles, and then to us. And the Spirit is involved in this whole process. Mm -hmm. If you think of it vertically, every time you celebrate the Mass, Father Dennis is only able to celebrate that Mass because he is given the power to do so by the bishop. The bishops are all connected back to the apostles, who then connects us back to Christ and the Father. Right? Everything hinges on them. Everything. And remember, it's the apostolic tradition and testimony because... Clearly, as we know in modern times and in ancient times, but unfortunately we've had to live through ones ourselves, do not confuse infallibility with impeccability. Infallibility says the church will not teach error. Christ never promises that the church will be sinless or even pure. We have had horrible human beings as popes in our history. It, there's no denying it. And any Catholics who try is just pretending to ignore history, right? Um, the, the Borgia popes who poisoned their rivals and one another and fathered lots of kids and everything else. And yet, none of them ever changed doctrine. So for we as Catholics today, we've been given the great gift in the catechism, things like that, to see for ourselves the church's teaching and understanding. Um, and so even though we're living through a time period where first we saw the failure of the priesthood, and well, just when we thought that was over in the last few years, we realized the bishops have been an enormous failure. Um, nevertheless, the tradition holds, sadly, in some periods of Christian history, and we're in one of them, the reality is that we have to fall back to what Jesus told his own followers about the Pharisees. Do what they say, but don't do as they do because they don't live out what they're supposed to be proclaiming. And so, um, as I point out here, what Jesus did is, I'll just read, let's do two things. If you, anyone who's welcome, who wants to stay just a few minutes, because I just want to cover something. But for those who can, I want to at least make a last point. On page 25, to take away this, take this away for the magisterium. Yes, it has problems. Yes, the human beings who fulfill it are problematic. They have been since the beginning, right? Judas was one of them. We need to see the great gift it actually is. And here's where the church defines it, right in the middle of page 25. The mission of the magisterium is linked to the definitive nature of the covenant established by God with his people in Christ, right? There's only going to be one covenant, no new ones. 
So this covenant is definitive. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us that we know the truth. It's not going to be changed or modified. It is this magisterium's task to preserve God's people from deviations and defections and to guarantee them the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error. Why, despite all the problems the church has in its leadership right now, why do we still consider the role of the teaching church, even if not the individual teachers per se, a gift? Is because when the church teaches something, you are guaranteed that if you follow it, you are doing the will of God. You're also guaranteed if you don't follow it, you're opposing his will. And we do not have to remake the wheel every time. We have the answers for thousands of years now, if not hundreds, depending on the topic. So some of you may be Protestant or come from Protestant backgrounds. There is no universal agreement among Protestants on how old you have to be to be baptized. There's no problem in Catholicism. We know. And we don't have to defend it. We can talk about it. Why? But we know. And so on and so forth. So it gives you the objective possibility that if you follow what the church teaches, not necessarily how the bishops act, but how the church teaches, you will be saved. There's just no way you can't be. However, the church is honest. It says it gives you the objective possibility of professing the true faith without error. Why possibility? Because you can be taught the truth, but it's up to you whether you accept and live it. The church can't stand in for that. It can only reveal to you what's there. Um, what I was going to just tell you really quick is, to see where we come from, a lot of Catholics like this, is King David was the first big king after Saul to unify um, the 12 tribes. And what David did, one of the great things he did is he brought all the, thor the, um, the, the, all the powers of Israel into one place. So he was the king, he founds Jerusalem, and then what does he do? He has the ark brought to Jerusalem. Before that, the ark went on a tour of different places throughout the country. He brings it there. So now you've got the kingship determined by God with the priesthood determined by God. And then he makes the prophetic school. So now the prophets live there. So he unites the priestly, prophet, and kingly authorities all in one place. Hence why Jerusalem is so important. What he did is David, as the first real king, Saul never really established a whole court. David establishes the court of Israel, right? What does the royal court look like? He also establishes the temple hierarchy. Although he doesn't build the temple, he prepares for it because in the Old Testament, it's very vague. If you're a Levite, then you're, a, then you're priestly. If you're of Aaron's clan, then you're a priest. And if you're of Aaron's direct family line, you can be the high priest, but that's it. So David is the one in the books of Chronicles and this one in the books of Samuel who gives us the two things. And this, like I said, this is kind of exciting, I think, for Catholics. Maybe you'll think it is, maybe not. What was the court of ancient Israel? The king, the queen mother, the title is the Gabira, the chief steward who held the keys, The three bodyguards who accompanied David and after him, every Davidic king afterwards. The 12 elders, each of who represented one of the tribes to the king. The 72 judges and prophets who proclaimed the king's justice throughout the country. And then the, um, the faithful. Then for the priests, he said, well, you have the high priest who's descended from Aaron. But there's several families from whom he can be drawn from, so those become the chief priests, who, has to, who you pick the high priest from. Then you've got the other clans of priests who are not descended from Aaron, so they can never be the high priest, but they're the regular priests. Then you have the whole tribe of Le Levi, the Levites, but except for a few families within the larger tribe, the Levites are all ordained by, by nature. You have to be a priest if you're a Levite. But if you're only a Levite, not a priest, you can't offer sacrifice and you can't forgive sin. Then they had the Nazarites, not, Naz not, not, not Nazareth. <laughs> Nazarites were men or women 
priests or lay people who took special vows for God. Right? Samson, you can't drink wine. You have to let your hair grow. You do these things. And then you have the laity. So this is the kingdom of God. Who's the king? Jesus. The queen mother, Mary. That's why Mary can be queen even though she's Jesus' mother. When your father died and you became king, your mother was the queen. Very practical. Why? You have a lot of wives. Think of Solomon. 800 wives. What 799 really powerful men does he get against him by choosing someone other than their daughter? So Israel is real easy. Well, who's going to take care of you even more than your wife? Your mom. So starting with, if you read through the books of Kings, in the first verse of every new king, his mother's name is given with him. She's the link that he's really the heir. The chief steward with the keys, we have Peter, the whole story of the keys. Did Jesus have three bodyguards? He does. James, Peter, and John are his most select group. He gives them names. Simon becomes Peter. James and John become the sons of Boanerges. And they're the only ones who see him raise the kids from the dead, who are on the mountain of the transfiguration, who um, are explained what will happen in the last days, and they're the only three who are allowed to go with Jesus inside the Garden of Gethsemane where the other eight stay outside to see the agony in the garden. So yeah, he has three. Peter, James, and John. Well, how about the elders? That one's easy, right? Because the 12 apostles, the 12. How about the 72 judges or prophets? Well, if you turn to John, just real quick, in chapter 9... I'll just read it to you fast so we can get you guys out of here. In chapter 9, the very first six verses says, He summoned the twelve, gave them power and authority over demons, and sent them out. Blah, 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 blah. Turn to the next chapter, 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others whom he sent ahead in pairs to every town he intended to visit. So yeah, we even have the 72. So Jesus literally reforms David's kingdom. He has the court. How about over here? Do we have a high priest? You bet we do. Who's he chosen from? The chief priests. Then we have our regular priests. Do we have Levites? Deacons. They're ordained. They help the priest, but they can't offer sacrifice or forgive sins. So no Eucharist consecration, no reconciliation, no anointing of the sick because it requires the ability to forgive sins. Do we have Nazarites? Sure we do. The religious orders, which can be male or female, clergy or laity, who take special vows. And then the laity. Everything we are as Catholics, everything, is this perfection of David's kingdom which is the first and only time in the Old Testament where, it is, where you hear the word, the kingdom of God. It's only found in the book of Chronicles. David was just the earthly image of what in perfection God had planned all along. So with that, sorry to keep you guys after it. Those who stayed, thank you. Um, remember next week, tell friends if they just want an easy one-time shot to hear about the mass and the book of Revelation. Otherwise, we'll just end really quick in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Help us, Lord, to become devoted to the gospel you have proclaimed in your church. And Lord, help us, even as laity, to act with authenticity and zealousness in pursuing your gospel so that the church may once again be the light of the world and the salt of the earth as we have been called to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Sorry to keep you guys. I appreciate that. Oh,